Even though Dan Cleveland has only a narrow half-acre lot, he's filled it with trees, shrubs, and fountains. There's even room for a chicken coop. The story of the garden and the gardener on A Gardener's Diary. Dan Cleveland and Jeffrey Rogerson live in the Berkeley Park neighborhood of Atlanta, Georgia. Dan is a professional landscape designer and has made the most of the limited space around the house, creating an inviting garden that reaches right out to the street. Dan, we're in Berkeley Park. Is that yes. right? Berkeley Park, a neighborhood in Atlanta. And it's obviously springtime with all these incredible flowers and combinations. The first thing I noticed about your garden when I drove up was that it's one of the few gardens where the house is almost insignificant. It really, you have to have a house to live in, but it's really a background. Everything is a background for the garden. Even the color of the house. Even the color of the house. The garden really is, is the introduction to the house, and um, we actually almost live in the garden because we love it so much. Well, there's just so much to look at and every time I think I've seen the best thing there's something else. Good. There's supposed to be surprises around every corner. <laughs> so having a small garden should not limit people. Oh no. Layer, layer, layer. Your garden has a very settled feel. It doesn't, it feels as if it's, you must have been working on it for years and years and the raised beds and the stonework and then the steps coming up from the street. Was this the first area you worked on? Well, the walls were one of the first areas we developed. Um, the house kind of sits high on a rise, um, and the foundation was more exposed on you know, the left side where the wall's a little bit higher. And so what I want to do is balance, make it more eye-pleasing and have more of a balance of feel across the front of the house. So we developed the wall to kind of give us that eye-pleasing uh, balance from the street. And the front yard just kind of rolled down to the street. There was no wall or anything, so I wanted a terrace effect. So we terraced the front, and when you look at the house, it kind of gives you a layering terrace effect. So your solution, that's a really great design idea for folks that have that. I've seen that a lot of exposed foundation. Instead of burying it in little round shrubs, right. putting the raised beds allows you to not only have some shrubs, but it also uh, lifts flowers. everything up and makes it easier to like, you know, to work in. I mean, your annuals, where the annuals in front of the boxwoods, it's much easier to maintain, you know, those plants. Um, but also, you get the layering effect when they cascade over the walls too. And scavola, that is such a great plant for the south. That's wonderful. We're in zone seven, and mm. it is an annual here, but it blooms at least for me, all, all summer, summer long. I pinch it back, keep it, you know, kind of in the control so it doesn't take over the Joseph coat. But I do want it to cascade over and give me that, you know, that bluish purple um, color. And, and I love this corally, apricot -y. Yeah, African daisy. It's, the That's contrast gorgeous. is wonderful. And it, it blooms all summer. It loves the heat. And this is very hot. And these plants thrive out here. And look at all the fun little things that you get to do when you do have stepping stones. That little blue star creeper or Laurentia. And, and the just... creeping genie. And, you know, things always are popping up from the seeds from the other plant material, violas and pansies. And and the way you let the, the Laurentia or the blue star creeper, it almost looks as if it's coming out of the little boxwood there. It's a little carpet underneath the boxwood. That's well, a great ground cover. It's wonderful. And it, that little blue, everyone loves blue, and it gives you that, you know, light blue color. And it blooms for a long period of time also. Um, I love it mixed with the dwarf mondo. It kind of gives you the color contrast of the dark green and the, the color of the leaves of the Laurentia. But um, I, I love that plant. I know it's hardy, winter hardy here in zone seven, but I think it's probably about at the limit for right. over winter. And I, th I have better luck in more blooms if it gets a lot of sun too. The more, it will grow kind of shade but gets thinner and doesn't bloom as well. I was raised in North Georgia on a farm with my parents and an uh, older brother uh, in a small town called Lyrely, Georgia. It's north of um, Rome and uh, we actually grew just about everything that we ate. Of course my mom and grandmothers both loved flowers and I was always 
why can't we have more flowers and less vegetables? Um, so I was always wanting to plant and help my mom and my grandmothers in their you know, flower garden areas, and uh, it just kind of stuck. I always liked that blooming aspect of the garden. Dan, we're on the side of the house, and you've got, this is a fairly narrow space. Is this, is this, an, this and right next to your neighbor's driveway. Right, it originally was a driveway, Erica, and we didn't park here because uh, our vehicles are a little bit larger, I guess, than the older vehicles that used to park here. And I wanted kind of to screen off the, uh, the glare from the, the house and the cars parked there. So the hedge eventually will give me that. It's new, um, but you know, I will, it'll be a clipped hedge and will create kind of a, a shade garden atmosphere in this area. Um, also, I raised the beds here also because we did have the water problem, the water settling up against the house. We put stone in mended the soil and started adding different um, perennials and also the boxwoods and stuff. But it, there's bulbs and everything added in here, so it changes throughout the season. And you've taken advantage of all your gardening space. You're gardening on the wall. You're gardening. You garden vertically. You garden in raised Latin. beds. You garden on the ground. Everywhere. I mean, I wanted to give some contrast between the window boxes, which are seasonal colors that change out, the clematis with the birdhouse on the wall. Um, just give you some different views when you walk by, you always will have something to look at. And even the um, English holly is planted in a uh, container to give it a little bit more height so the ferns around the base of it will kind of come through and peek through, uh, through the holly. This is another good idea for, even if you didn't have a drainage problem, for giving more Elevation. height to the garden and substance. Just, it's a, it's not too tall, I imagine it's the same. Oh yeah, it's, it's only six to eight inches. Um, you know, it's not hot at all, but it will give you uh, foundation plantings will lift them up a little bit higher. And such a welcoming gate. Uh, love the moon gate. We had a privacy gate at this area, and it kind of was not inviting. And so the moon gate, it pulls you down the pathway, and then it's so inviting, you know, for the back in the back garden. Do you come out here and find people peeking around? Always, and they <laughs> stop right here. You know, people don't intrude on the back garden. They seem like they want to come here and stand and look at the back versus opening the gate and going through. Oh, it's perfect. Dan Cleveland and Jeffrey Rogerson have created a unique garden in their neighborhood in Atlanta, Georgia. Before he got into garden design, Dan worked in the retail clothing business. Believe it or not, a lot of what he learned carried over into his current career and how he approaches his own garden. The concept of um, retailing is always have a focal point, have a feature item, pull the customer through the store, you know, pull that customer down an aisle. It's the same concept as pulling someone into the garden, look at that beautiful flower, but turn a corner and then there's another special plant. And I think that really helped me when I really dove into the gardening and uh, landscape career. This red bud, this, I guess this is forest pansy, forest pansy. is a perfect umbrella for this Japanese maple that you have in this big beautiful pot. Yeah, it's a combination. I wanted that maroon, that reddish color in the garden and, and the combination of these is wonderful. And you know, it gives you great fall color also. I mean, it's, it's a great, great combination. So this, does this turn uh, oranges and all those oranges, oranges reds, and reds yellows? and touch of yellows. Um, the story behind this tree was I had it a client of a uh, house a tree fell, broke all the back limbs of it off. And so, you know, we couldn't use it at that job anymore. So I had a perfect spot because using it up against the fence, um, you know, as a flat side and a beautiful side. So by putting it in the container and lifting it up eye level, it worked great underneath this forest pansy. And then you've dressed it up at the base with all these beautiful pots with ferns and other Yeah, shrubs. most of these are evergreen. So, you know, when you walk up the path and we eat here at this area a lot, it always, you know, it's always kind of finished and looks really good. And then this table has the same, similar color as your pot, another yeah. shade of green. Yes, I love green, and I try to pick it up as much as I can. Um, the table itself, you know, the, the slate came first. This is a great find. I found this at a junk store and just had to have it. It was one of those finds you're just so happy to find. And, um, and then the urn came a little bit later. 
Um, and the combination, I thought, worked out perfect in this spot. You used to have just an iron table uh, setting here and stuff, and this is much more me and fits the area so much better. And everywhere you look, this is a 360-degree view. Inviting you to look at the garden and, and hear the fountains and see the garden itself. Dan, this is breathtaking, this view here through the through the arch of, it looks like Osmanthus. It's a holly. It's a holly. A, yeah, like we had two hollies. We tied them together and trained them to have the arch and the entrance to the back. It kind of separates the room, you know, it makes that surprise feeling when you turn that corner and look through there. It's the wow effect oh, when people totally. just get a glimpse of all this back here and yet another arch and so many surprises. And this foxglove is just, that color is so saturated and. It's beautiful, it's Pam's choice. Love it, you know, it picks up the, the maroon colors that echo through this area of the garden. And this is a biennial foxglove. Yes, you know, if you leave your um, plants on there long enough, it will develop seeds mm -hmm. from the seed heads. And I love the size of this. I like the big, oh, yeah. tall. The impact. Because they bloom all the way up the stems, they give you mm -hmm. more and more and more. And the design of this garden is interesting that it, it's, it's a complete circle. Yes. I want to kind of have area that, you know, if you could come out and sit or accumulate with people and, and make it have interest of people in this area, is kind of a meeting place. And it was the only place that was a little bit large enough that you could do that. Um, but I wouldn't have a focal point. And it was lawn at one time and we did away with lawn and um, had the pea gravel theme from the entrance to the garden all the way through and just tied it into this area. But uh, by having the circle, it kind of made it feel a little bit larger also. But there again, it is layered, you know, with the, uh, the ripe, the annuals, the boxwoods, the hydrangeas, the forest pansies. So it gives you a layering effect, which obviously, you know, makes everything feel a little bit larger. And this beautiful Graham Thomas, Graham um, Stewart Thomas, this rose, that soft, soft yellow. And uh, the dark maroon of this, I patio guess Patio peach. Oh, it's a peach. Yeah, okay. it's a patio peach. There again, it picks up that color that we're trying to introduce in this area. Um, beautiful, beautiful spring color. It has that beautiful pink color on it when it blooms, but then the rose comes out and it just layers in that color. The Graham Thomas, it, you know, it's aggressive grower, but you can't beat the yellow blooms oh, of the Graham Thomas. And it smells good. And oh yeah, it's a great cut flower have a collection of rooster sculptures tucked in among the plants. This is part of a general plan to include birds and animals in their garden in Atlanta, Georgia. You know, family p pets, I totally agree that they are part of the garden. Ranger is absolutely one of the best creatures in the world. Um, luckily, Ranger was very smart and easy to train, and he's never really destroyed the garden. Um, I also love to incorporate the, you know, feeding the birds and having the water features and watering the birds. There's one creature that I just, uh, I collect and we have a huge collection of in and outside of the house. Chickens, roosters and hens. We have um, a very nice collection indoors, but we also incorporate that into the outside. We have pets, um, we have a marigold and tilly are our new hens, and they're just wonderful creatures. They're so tame. And we have uh, Strut and Sophia, um, and they, uh, you know, they produce eggs. They give us, you know, joy in our garden, and we really like to let them loose, and they scratch and peck, and we have to shoo them back into the pens when they get out of, the, out of control, but they're really wonderful. We're standing under or next to and under one of my favorite trees, a yellow wood, and yours is in bloom. Is this the first time it's bloomed? Yes, and it's wonderful. It's been in about three years, Erica, and you know, it comes out, the leaves are so chartreuse on it, and then it blooms. It blooms after the dogwoods, and it's, you know, I, I love this plant because it blooms and gives you that white blossom in your garden after the, you know, dogwoods are gone. So you've had this about three years. So how, it, how large was it when you started? Um, it was like a two inch caliber. Uh, that's the trunk size. And it, it really has a, you know, developed a head since it's been in the ground. Because it loves this area because of the, the maples in front. And we do keep it water because there's some hydrangeas under planting it. And yes. another arbor here, which kind of mirrors your arch, but this is a hard structure. Right, this separates the rooms again, you know, trying to you know, stop your eye and gives another surprise in the area. 
And this clematis, what a luscious color. Beautiful on the front side for the color, but the back of it, look how gorgeous. Wow. Mm. The back of the blossoms are just as pretty, the buds mm -hmm. and the back of the blooms. And this chartreuse beneath it, that's just the right cut foil, I think, for that blue. Yes, it is. And then that takes us right back to the chicken house. Yep. And right in front of the chicken house, you've got this great, uh, I call it potato vine, or is that what you call it, potato vine? Potato vine, uh-huh. It's Selenum jasminoides. I know it's in the... Right, and it's an evergreen vine, Erica. Needs a little protection. Um, it gets it in this area, but it will get burned. And you can slightly cut it back um, after the you know winter frost on it and such, but it blooms all summer. A great cut flower. You can use it to tuck in any arrangement because of the white flowers. The garden of Dan Cleveland and Jeffrey Rogerson wraps around their home in Atlanta, Georgia. They've been able to take advantage of smaller spaces by using vertical plantings, including a tree grown right on the side of the house. We're on the side of the house here, and just like every other space in your garden, you've taken an opportunity to display plants. And you've got this fig, which has these great leaves. Erica, this is the west, western side of the house. Very hot, totally hot afternoon sun all summer. Anyway, I wanted something to help cool the side of the house without taking all the sun away from the roses and the irises and such. So I espaliered the figs, and I, and I chose three different varieties to see which variety would do the best. It produces figs, but the birds usually gets the figs. Right. And it's okay, because um, they need to eat too. But <laughs> The, wonderful, the most wonderful thing about the fig is looking from the inside and looking through these large leaves is just just wonderful. You know, the, the sun hits it. Effect. Absolutely, and it's just beautiful. And I like the way that this path is not straight, but it your eye not only your eye but the little arbors that you've created curve and so it's a winding path. Right, it's mostly very... all the landscape books and such tell you to don't do much to your side garden but I wanted to cut flower more of a perennial side and by doing the arches it gave me some height for the roses by making it not straight kind of your eye pulls you towards you know that plant and that plant versus you know looking straight down at the gate on the other end. This is such a diminutive little rose it's got the single petals and the two tones and the color that pink and that white. That's wonderful. Erica this it climbs, um, and we, I tie it up on the arbor to keep it, you know, so you can pass through underneath the arbor. But this is an excellent rose for uh, to grow into a tree, because uh, and, and, it will cascade out of the tree. It's a repeat bloomer. It's called Mozart, and it's it's a wonderful, wonderful rose. I just I love the color and I love the size of it. As you said, to grow up in the and a tree, it wouldn't take over the tree. No, it actually, you know, it'll go towards a light more so, but um, it's it's not like New Dawn or some of the other roses that are very aggressive growing. It's just very cascading, you know, it, it extend out. Here it's kind of tight because we tie it up a lot. And it repeat blooms, so what about pruning? Um, after it blooms, if you trim it back, kind of shape it and keep it in size, um, and then take out the old canes, it'll be fine. What gives me the, the most pleasure from my garden is today would be the yellow rose. Tomorrow it would be the pink rose, or it could be something else. So I always have something that gives me joy because there's always something happening, changing, blooming, and you know you always have interest in this garden. Come on.